Hey guys, it's Chrissy here with Writing Worship. I wanted to share with you today the top 10 characteristics of worship songs. I believe it's really important for us to know what identifies a worship song if we're going to be writing them for our congregations. Um, now, there are some things that can vary a little bit depending on seasons and cultures and styles, but there are some things that should never change. So let's dig in. Number one is the only one that should never, ever, ever change, and that is they should be true and biblically accurate because these days song teaches theology. And we all know that that is the most important part about what we're teaching lyrically is we're teaching what the Bible has to say. So that can't change. Number two, a community voice. So that means that our songs are usually, these worship songs are in the tense of we, as in we are all worshiping together, or you, as in we are worshiping you, Jesus. Um, and that makes a lot of sense in a congregational context because we want everyone to feel included. We want them to feel welcome to sing the song with us. There are the occasional I songs out there, but they're just more rare in the worship world. Number three, a simple, memorable lyric. Um, we want everyone to be able to sing and worship more than they have to think. So keep it simple with your melody lines and the lyrics as well. Um, number four, stay close to an octave in range. Um, yes, there are some people that can jump that octave and do lots of vocal acrobatics, but for the general person in the congregation, if they're trying to figure out how to hit a note, they instantly stop thinking about worship and they're distracted. So we don't want that to happen. Keep it simple. Keep it an, within an octave in range if you can. Number five, they can bring some sense of familiar um, from the church from the past, meaning it could be a reference to a hymn. It might be a lyrical reference. It might be a melodic reference. But somehow pulling in some of the history of the church is a beautiful thing that we see in many worship songs. Number six, there is always resolution or redemption thematically. Um, I think about lots of songs that come to mind when I think of this topic, lots of worship songs. So there's nothing wrong with stating where we are or stating the, the honesty of our hearts or the depths that we've been in. But what makes us different as Christians is that we always have hope. And I think that's important to have expressed in our worship songs too. We always should have hope. Number seven, they show a greater picture. So sometimes we get stuck in our microscope worlds and we'll walk into church and there's this beautiful expression of widening our perspective and remembering how great God is and how this is a worldwide, a universe-wide, a heaven-wide perspective. And um, that's one thing that many worship songs do very beautifully. Um, number eight, they tell the story of the gospel very simply. Um, they share the, the heart of Jesus and, and what he did and how he died for us. And that's really important to have in song because that's the heart of our message. Number nine, they call us to action or call us to respond. It may be lifting hand, hands, it may be running to his arms, uh, it may be bowing down, but they give us directives, even, even if it's just something we do in our hearts. Maybe we don't physically do those things, but hearing those things helps to posture hearts. And that's one thing um, that I notice a lot of songs do. Number 10, and this might be my favorite, they remind us of what's to come. They help us keep our eyes on um, the hope of redemption and resolution and heaven and all of those old things passing away and no more sorrow and being with Jesus and seeing him face to face. I want to share with you the five purposes of writing worship songs. I know a lot of times we'll get questions from people saying, you know, I've written my songs and now I'm not sure what purpose they're serving or how to get them out there or which avenue I should be sharing them. And I think it'll help you just to have these five things in mind um, because, you know, there's a wide scope of how God can use our songs. Many people think it's just the worldwide platform. 
And honestly, I've never tried to write for the world platform and hit that target. That's never once happened for me. Although I have had a couple of songs that have done that, I was writing them from a different place. And so let me share some of those other places with you. Um, the first reason why we might write a worship song is just for the sake of blessing God alone. Um, I can't tell you how many days I've sat here at my piano and written things, little songs that no one will ever hear that were just really intended to praise God. And I know that those are cherished by him. And that is enough reason in itself to write a song. Number two, a lot of times I have sat at this very piano and written a song um, that I was just expressing my heart to God and he spoke back to me in that moment. And that song, I know blessed him, but it also was for me personally. And it made an impact. Some of those songs have made an impact on me in life-changing ways because I heard directly from the Lord through that song. Number three we can write these songs to bless God, but also somebody else and their relationship with him. Um, I can't tell you how many songs I've written for weddings, funerals, baby dedications, for somebody that was sick. And are those things that will ever be uh, shared beyond those people? Well, I don't know. Do I believe it blesses the church or blesses hearts? Absolutely, in ways we'll probably never see until we get to heaven. Number four, um, we write worship songs to praise God corporately. So that means with our church body. And that's those that are in our congregation and in our life. And um, those are beautiful and it edifies those individual bodies. And it gives them their song to sing for their time, for their purpose, for their town. And number five is the last one. And that's where... It gives us a corporate way to worship God around the world. So there are very few songs that fit into that category. Um, but these are the songs that when we gather in arenas, it gives us that common union, that common thread that runs through all of us. And um, it's a beautiful way to worship from a worldwide perspective. Um, and again, I want to reiterate, not all the songs that we write are number fives. In fact, I, ha I have had a couple of number fives, but I thought they were number ones when I was writing them. And I really think if our hearts are in the right place as we're writing these songs, that God will then lead the songs where they need to go. I really believe that. If we just stay where we're planted, work from where we are, give what we have and what we know, he'll do the rest. I wanted to talk a little bit today about why we need new worship songs. Um, first of all, I think it's really important for us to notice what the Bible says about new songs. And um, basically, number one, the Bible tells us we need new songs. So it says in Psalm 96, 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. I love that it says sing a new song inside of the old songs. And I think it's meant to be a reminder for us that we wouldn't forget how important those songs are. Um, there's a lot that's going on right now with music and churches are writing their own songs and it's, it's actually seeming like a new thing, but it's a very ancient thing and it's beautiful. So let's dig into a little bit more about why that might be a good thing. Not just because the Bible says, but how does it affect our church and our people? Um, well, first of all, it brings fresh praise to God and it brings fresh revelation to us. He is a creative God. He loves being told that we love him in new ways, just like you or I would in any relationship. And bringing him a new song is a way to do that. We also receive fresh revelation as we're doing so and as we're writing these songs. And sometimes the Lord gives us um, just insight on how to express something in a new way that's never been expressed that same way before. You know how I feel. When, when you've heard a song um, and for the first time it, it expresses a feeling that you've never been able to express, it moves you so deeply. Secondly, I believe that new songs are able to go beyond language and speak a dialect. When you write songs that are specifically for your church, 
You can use words that matter to your church. You can use things that are, are very important for your denomination. Um, you can stay away from things that people don't want to touch on. So it's a, a customizable way to make sure that what they're hearing doesn't bring any distractions into the room, that they can worship right where they are, as they are. And overall, you want those songs to feel like home. Third, they bring unity to the church. This conversation that would happen in a healthy dynamic where the pastor and the worship leader are having you know, conversations about what the Lord is saying and seeing patterns in what God is speaking. And if the pastor can line his message up with a melody, it'll impact the congregation all week long. Fourth, a new song can minister to the congregation right where they are. Just like when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, Miriam broke out that tambourine and celebrated through song and led the people through song. We can do the same thing. And it might be a high like that, a celebration, or it could be something sad, something hard that our church is walking through. But songs can speak on a heart level and bring either healing or joy to the congregation. Um, finally, I think new worship songs can prepare congregations for the future. Many of the songwriters in the Bible also happen to be prophets, and I believe that is still true for today. Sometimes I've written a song with no knowledge that the Lord would use it in a different way than I intended because of what was coming in the future. And many times we will write according to what the pastor has laid out as a plan for where he's leading the church. We'll write songs to help lead them in the same direction. Do I think that all we need are new songs? No, I think we need a balance. In Ephesians, Paul talks about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But I've just noticed that if we're going to forget any, usually it's the new ones. But you can be a part of helping us not to forget to incorporate those new songs into our churches. I wanted to share a little bit with you about the songwriter personality test today. Um, I noticed after several co-writes, and you may have co-written some too, that there are different types of people that operate in different ways in the room. And over time, I began to sort of identify which ones I was working with as quickly as I could so that we made the best use of everyone's time. Over time, I created this songwriter personality test, and you can take it too. It's free. On the songwriter personality test, there are really three categories or three different types of writers. One is the lyric type writer. And in that section of things, we have our content writers. And then in the center of our graph, we have what we call our crafters. And those can lean either toward the lyric or toward the music. They can lean either way. And in that section, we have our hearing prophetic writers, our concept writers, our structure writers. And then on the other side of our diagram, we have our musical um, writers. And those are our melody writers, our producer track writers, and our chords arranging writers. Why is it important to know what kind of songwriter you are? First of all, it gives you confidence when you walk in the writing room, whether you're working on your own, honestly, or in a co-writing situation, to know what your strengths are. When you know what your strengths are when you walk in a room, you also don't have to be all the other strengths. I remember used to feeling like I had to carry everything and I had to be good at everything, when I walked in the room, and that's simply not true. God made us to fit together. So when you know what your strength is, it gives you confidence, and then it also helps you to know how to work with others that have different strengths than you so that you have the best best experience in the co-writing room, not only just dynamically, but also you get to create the best songs that way, bringing in strengths that are opposites. Um, they bring together a beautiful song. So in order to take this test, you need to go visit songwriterpersonalitytest.com. It'll take you about five to seven minutes. Like I said, it's a free test. It's a great tool for giving you confidence and then also helping you know how to set up your co-write. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the importance of co-writing. So for many, many years, I wrote on my own and didn't really understand the concept of co-writing um, until much later in my writing career. 
And once I dove into it, it seemed like a scary thing and I had some bad experiences right away that sort of made me apprehensive about continuing to go down that path. What I now know, after pressing through some of those hard rights, um, is it's super important for us to be able to write in community. Um, first of all, because that is a picture, a musical expression of the body of Christ working together. And many strengths can operate together in the same room to create something more beautiful than any one strength could have created on its own. I also believe diversity is very important. So including as much diversity as possible in a writing room means that when the song is delivered, um, those different types of people will resonate with that song. And I just think it's a beautiful way to work together to build kingdom. Um, you will find over time, if you're writing with the right writers that will um, complement your strength and not clash with your strength, and again, we've talked previously about the songwriter personality test, but that's a great tool for you to use. Um, if you're using that tool and you're setting yourself up right, when you walk in the room, it should be a much more successful and an enjoyable write. And I'm super excited um, for you and your co-writing journey. And once you've written songs with your church, please share them here. Upload them right here to SongShare and share them with your church, your city, and your world. I wanted to share with you some tools and apps that would really make a big difference in your songwriting. These are things that I use in every write, and um, I think if you could have them ahead of time, get them set up on your computer and ready to go, um, that it'll help you a whole lot. So I usually have four tabs at least open on my computer as I'm writing, and these are the things that I use. Um, the first one is called rhymebrain.com. And I love a songwriter setting that they have on RhymeBrain. So I can type in a word and it'll give me rhymes. Um, and it'll also give me more additional information. So they also have um, an invent a word type setting, which is really fun if you want to just experiment. Um, and then the second tab that I always have open is Google Docs. Um, some people um, go back and forth on how they feel about this, especially if you're in a co-writing situation because you can see in live time what somebody else is typing. I personally love it. I love to see what people are thinking and, um, and that way we can compile all our thoughts onto one document. I would add don't delete other people's info that they've shared on there though. Um, what I usually do is I'll just move it down to what I call the basement. Move it down on your page. And then that way you still have it or they still have it if they want to use it in a different song. Um, the third tab I always have open is dictionary.com. And I love that because I can search deeper meanings of words or maybe synonyms, things like that. But I also can right on that website, click over to thesaurus.com and um, get those synonyms and things that I need. So dictionary.com. Fourth one that I always have on my computer is BibleGateway.com. And um, just having scripture easily accessible. And a lot of times I'll, I'll think of a verse, but I won't remember the reference. And I can type in a few words there and usually find what I'm looking for. And many, many times what I find um, from just those fragments of verses that are stuffed in my heart um, will lead us to a verse or a chorus or whatever it is that we need. So use that resource as you're writing worship songs. There's nothing more potent than God's words. Um, a couple of other things on my phone that I always have handy. One is I use my notes app all the time um, to put my song ideas in and it's very helpful and that way you'll always have it with you. If you need it, um, when you go into co-writes especially, you always want to bring ideas, and that's a great place to store them. And finally, voice memos. So melodically, you don't want to forget what you wrote down lyrically. And in that case, you can record a quick voice memo. And I love now that you can search, you can title each memo, and you can search and find those things when you walk into a co-write. Um, I have been titling all my ideas as idea something and then idea. 
So maybe it's um, a surrender song and I put surrender idea in the voice memo title. That way when I walk into a write, I can type in um, in the search bar of voice memos idea and it'll bring up all my ideas and then I can look through and decide if there's something that is um, worth sharing for that co-write or meant for that day. I wanted to share with you today a concept called song mapping. And I first learned this when I was getting started writing songs. In general, a lot of times creatives, we have to allow the flow to happen. And what I've noticed is if we stop and stop and stop that flow, it will make the right much, much harder. So what I would encourage you to do is to let the flow happen right in the beginning of the right. And sometimes that's musically, but we're going to talk more specific about lyrically right now. And when we use this concept called song mapping, I first encourage you to brainstorm. So maybe, like I had a song one time called Umbrella, um, maybe you take that concept and you write every word you can think of related to that word. Or maybe you ask questions about that word or phrase or concept. Um, or maybe you think about adjectives or adverbs that describe that word, but let yourself sort of get all of your thoughts out regarding that one thing. And then what I like to do is I put the concept in the very center of my page. So for my umbrella song, the concept was umbrella. That was in the center of the song. And I had all kinds of ideas that would then spoke out from that center idea. Now, when we relate it to our song, that center would be our chorus. We want everything to support that center idea in the chorus. So from that center, you wanna make connecting lines um, and little family bubbles. So whichever concept you put down here, like maybe you put rain under that umbrella concept and maybe under rain, you have different kinds of rain. So again, little bubbles of families that are all related. And when you're finished, those little related bubble families could be possibly verses or they could possibly be a bridge idea, um, but you want everything to point back to that center concept or that center bubble. And overall, really, this is a great way to get started writing songs. It helps you to be able to structure songs correctly and to make sure that everything stays on target for what you originally intend.